what this amazing garden turns into as we go forward. So, got to say, thank you very much, Matt, for your time as always. Really is appreciated. Thank you for the quality banter running through this video. Yeah, yeah don't come back, Josh. I, I shan't be. And hopefully one day soon, Chris will be here to put together a more professional looking video, do you reckon? I'm still waiting for the call, but you know, one can only hope. The red carpet's rolled up, the room's ready. What more could he possibly want? Hello? Hi Mark, it's Chris, how are you? I'm alright mate, is that Yorkshire Chris? Yes, it's Yorkshire Chris, the one and only. Oh thank God, I've been waiting for someone who's good to come and look at my garden. When are you going, can you come? I can come around straight away if that's alright. Brilliant mate, yeah, I'll roll the carpet out for you. Here we are in Mark's garden in Lincolnshire and we're gonna have a tour around the garden and we're gonna have a chat as we go around um, and yeah, let's have a look at the garden. So That's it? You, yeah, very well, thank you. Thanks for coming. It's nice to finally have some gardening royalty here. <laughs> Usually have to put up with George, um, but like I said, I did, didn't manage to put the red carpet out of you today, Chris. It's currently being dry cleaned after um, after Alton John made a mess of oh, it. So, oh, nice. um, But yeah, no, it's um, nice to have you here. It's not very sunny. Couldn't bring the sun from Wakefield, you've hogged all of it, but... Um... Yeah, it was honestly blisteringly hot when I left this morning, and uh, come come out of Yorkshire, not far. Just a... Not too far, yeah. just over the motorway, but yeah. So Chris slid into my DMs and asked to come and have a look and try... He, he, he's been through the garden already and had a quick look, and he uh, reassuringly told me it looks bigger in person, which is not something... I don't hear it very often, um, but yeah. So I suppose it's an update and a bit of a follow-on, a lot of the guys that watch your videos will also watch George's videos and I suppose it's a summer update of how things have gone, how things have grown, how things have developed. Um, I mean I'll just say if you haven't already done so check out George's videos. Oh 100%. Uh, because he's obviously he's done several videos of, uh, of the garden already. You'll get to listen to my dulcet tones for another two or three hours if yeah. you wish um, and see more of the garden. The last garden video we did was kind of showing the destruction of winter. So this is an opportunity to see how we really fared this summer. Now, I've had a, quite a busy year with one thing or another, and the garden has been completely neglected. The plan was for me to open up for the National Garden Scheme. That was due to be two weekends ago, the 28th of uh, August. It didn't happen. So I haven't been out. So there's weeds, there's things that haven't been planned in the way I'd want them to, and overall, I haven't had the opportunity to give it anywhere near as much of a clean up. Um, haven't trimmed any bushes, I'm afraid. Um, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, I'm sure it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's looking natural. It's looking... Uh... I, George told me I go for the natural look. Yeah. So, um, so... Let's have a look at these. Yeah, the so the, the Cycads, um, they, uh, they're their first year in situ. They haven't flushed in where they are. They are possibly due to think about it there's a little bit of a swirl going on in the center there um that they're probably going to flush next year i haven't yeah. given them any particular watering other than rainwater. um i've underplanted with some curex um oshimensis maybe um again a couple of them that they came from a company um that sent them basically burr root I've watered them when I remembered and otherwise just sat them in place. I had some Curex grasses in there, some offshoots from my garden that just died a death. So I bought some and put them in there. And my hope is that in a year or so, this is going to be the real bright, vivid green of the cycads and the really vivid, bright undertones of the lime green. Yeah, I'm sure it'll come together. I mean, just for the viewers that might not have seen uh, George's videos, so I'll just Coming yeah. Straight into this video. How long have you had this garden? And so this garden. So we've been here for nine years. Um, I haven't. Uh, the garden itself um, has been an accumulation of plants over about seven years. But the garden itself was all lawn four years ago. Right. Okay. Um, if anyone chooses to look back through the the Facebook groups, UK Tropical Look Gardening, Hardy Tropical Gardening, um, Turn It Tropical, you'll see me asking questions about the design how to do things where to put things and after gathering advice from all sorts of people and doing a hell of a lot of my own research at two o'clock in the morning not being able to sleep 
um, this is what I've come up with. Um, everything that you see has grown in that period of time, um, as well as obviously greenhouses being put in place, yeah, hard landscaping. Some, you've got some pretty amazing structures in the garden and, yes. and all sorts. To yeah, there's quite, there's quite a lot to see. Um, so in the dry bed this year, yeah. we've got the addition of the agave media pictoralba, uh, agave avatifolia. Um, the, I, I've also taken everything up, laid a weed membrane and then recovered with basalt. So that's really helped suppress a huge number of the weeds that we had and it looks much better for it. It's far, far less maintenance now. Yeah, and it'll soak up that summer heat and uh, 100%. sustain it. And, it, and, and it, this, everything is planted basically into grit. Um, there's fantastic drainage. There's very little soil in there. It's all grit. It's not, an, it's not a finished structure. Everything, there is going to be additions to it, but I just haven't figured out what they are. I'm just trying to let everything grow, see how things turn out and go from there. Um, Japanese area um, has really kind of flourished this year, actually. Um, the um, this variegated aurelia it looks incredible actually and the leaves haven't become very sunburnt the variegation is just fantastic um, it's looking really good I, I grow the same plant but in more of a shady location so yeah. you could see that it, it keeps the variegation I mean to this is obviously it's, it's as exposed as it can be and two years ago this was a twig so this year this has grown really well and I'm very happy with its location Japanese mock orange smell absolutely divine earlier in the year. Now it's just kind of taken up a lot of the way, but I don't have the heart to cut it back. Um, this is my other Sago bed um, that you guys will have seen. A couple of them haven't done very well and I lost a couple of them last year, but this one has just literally started to flush in the last two weeks. Um, now that has had a very heavy seaweed feed at the base and it's been watered a couple of times a week, very heavily in the crown. So you've been given that sort of like monsoon conditions. Exactly. Yeah, no. And it's flushed. Yeah. So they do flush if you replicate what they need in order to flush. Um, so last year, this didn't get protected, completely dropped the ball. This year, it will be getting protected because my aim is to keep all the cycads looking as good as they can yeah, do. Because they're definitely well worth protecting. 100%. You know, they, they are slow to yeah. to flush in terms of, you know, you've got to give the right condition to make them flush, but without, <laughs> it's quickly to, very quick for the leaves to die off if they get a bit of cold, basically. They hate the cold, but there is, I mean, this year, this is flushed, that's flushed, this plant behind is flushed, and this plant is flushed. So this is evidence that even if you do drop the ball and don't protect things over winter, they still can come back if you replicate the conditions they require. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, you know, I learned the hard way. Maybe you guys don't have to, um, but I won't be making the same mistake again. Sorry about the building noise. Um, yeah, um, that's, we're building George's cage. Um, <laughs> If you want to back up slightly, Chris, yeah, I'll will. take you into the greenhouse, um, which is is looking rather ridiculous. So we've got a, a sort of a lean-to greenhouse, I suppose, but on a, a huge scale. So, so it's someone's old extension, um, which was built outside of planning permission or planning regulations. So they stuck it on eBay. I found it and bought it and. Built a, built a brick wall, built the foundations and, you know, had designed that I would kind of have a tropical hothouse. Um, in the past, I have heated it to keep it tropical conditions, but I found that heating it to a tropical conditions makes no difference to whether the plants live or not. Um, and so everything in here lives with very little attention. It gets watered thoroughly once a week. Um, and the rest of the time, it just does its own thing. So we have the bananas that are still in place that you that. should have seen. So this yeah. is this is Musa ice cream blue Java. Edible bananas. It should be. I'm hoping so. I need to cut the cord at some point and let them ripen. And I'm going to try them. My son is desperate to try them. Um, and 
Yeah, so that's not something you see every day. And uh, very, are, no, no, very in much. Pretty much north of England, so that's, yeah. that's pretty incredible. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm the first, but... Um, you know, maybe we'll raffle off an opportunity to eat one of my bananas. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's, sure it's some, it's, some takers. possibly, yeah, possibly. Um, passion flower is in full bloom. You can see around. I've just let everything do its own thing this year. I haven't tidied it up, so we've got passion flower binds here, full of flowers. Um, the bromeliads have really gone for it. I've got vander orchids here, which are about to bloom, and some which are at the end of their bloom. Um, these have, again have just kind of really gone for it. Um, I've got some new additions of some bromeliads over here. So I've got some Achmias, um, Achmia blanchettiana orange is here. Um, and that, if anyone knows, is a, it gets absolutely ginormous. Now that came from Portugal a few weeks ago and they can take up to 60 days to root. So that needs a long it time. Yeah, it needs a long time sat there. You need to regularly check them to make sure the base isn't rotten. They look pretty ropey at the moment, but in theory, in a not too long period of time, they should be looking fantastic. This is mountain papaya. Oh, um, nice. yep. That came from um, Jane and Alan's score at Winterton Gardens uh, last year from their open garden. I bought it. That's I really overwintered fantastic. it. Another fantastic garden. Yes, worth, yeah. Uh, absolutely and so that is uh, that now this is going to get way too big for in here but the leaves are just looking incredible so if i have to coppice it or buy another one i don't know but it's looking great um so how have you found so this year it's been a bit of a mediocre summer yes um you know july was a bit of a write-off august was so so now we've come in september um, and it's probably going to be the hottest week of the year baking yeah um, absolutely gorgeous um, although it's a bit overcast at the moment how have you found growth in the greenhouse? Ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the whole structure is double glazed. We have got a 55% shade cloth up everywhere. The first year I ran it as a greenhouse, I found that everything got sunburnt. So it is fully shaded. The floor has got water bottles in, which are full of water, which acts as a heat sump as well as the brick wall. So some days in here, this structure will hit 45, 50 degrees with no issue. Um, and in the weeks where it's very hot, I'll just water it twice. Um, if you were to put your hand onto the compost in the beds now, it would probably be bone dry. And yet everything in here looks pretty good. Um, everything's looking very lush. I've added to the green walls. I've got some begonies in there. I've got some more pothos in there. Um, and you'll see I have even more Spanish moss. I know, it, I didn't think it was possible, but there is. Yeah, yeah it just lots. it just grows like wildfire in here. It absolutely loves it. Um, I will take a banana skin, stick it in water, leave it for a couple of days, and then use the banana water as a feed, very, very dilute, and it. spray it on. Um, <clears throat> you can see I've got some Evander orchid coming to the end of its bloom here. Ah, beautiful. But this is this is what I do it for. The van der orchids are absolutely my favourite plant in here, by a, by a country mile. Oh, very nice. So they flower sporadically, or they flower very sporadically. Um, it, they absolutely demand the heat. Like they 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 crave that 40, 50 degree heat. And if they don't have it, they don't flower. Um, but yeah, they're about my favourite. I'm always looking for more. Um, I've had a lot that have succumbed and they've not quite been right, but some of them, they just do fantastically well and they come back year after year. There's one behind you that's actually got, it's a ginormous one, it's actually got two flower spikes on it. Um, uh, yeah. God knows how old it is, but it, uh, it, look, it looks really good. It looks yeah, great. It looks really good. And basically it's getting all its nutrients and everything from... from Those the, aerial roots, yeah. absolutely. And again, they, they only get watered once a week. They just get an absolute dousing of the roots. Um, everything gets fully watered at the base. And then I'll stand in the doorway with the hose on a mist setting and I'll fill the whole thing with mist to saturation, lock the doors, and leave it. Brilliant. So what are these structures, these lights up here we've got? Yeah, they're all parkans from a theatre. Okay. I got them off Facebook Marketplace okay. for like 20 quid or something like that. And my electrician, I've got a buddy who's a good electrician and he just put everything in, so... Um, so yeah, I've got old park hands all the way around and it just looks a bit cool and 
<clears throat> when the greenhouse was very new, I had everything lit up and it all at night, and I thought, oh, this is brilliant. Yeah. Then I thought, this is costing too much. <laughs> I well, kind of the into it, you know, and I suppose we should mention is obviously the cost of the heat in a, a heated greenhouse. Yes, is getting more and more expensive as the years have gone. Yeah, off. and 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 again, that's one of the principal reasons why I now don't heat it unless we're expecting minus temperatures for a full period of time. Right. So this heater here, it's a two kilowatt heater. Um, one of the um, can't remember the name of the company, the, but the Phoenix one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that will go on. I will come out at night in my dressing gown, stick it on, and if we have a week's worth of sub-zero temperatures, that will keep this room above that. Yeah. So it's not on a thermostat, it's literally just down to you remembering to turn it on? Or... Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and I guarantee you there are times where I've left it on for too long, and I guarantee you there are times where I completely forgot to put it on at all. And there have been a, so many points of trial and error with this whole greenhouse that I have plants that have, I mean, you can see on here, I've got my platycerium bifurcator mounted 2011, 2019. So that'll be coming up to its fourth year of being in place. Yep. And that was when I really started putting everything in here and everything got heated. And I was so paranoid about it going below 10 or 15 degrees that everything was on thermostats and I did have everything set up with Wi-Fi and I was checking everything over. And then I kind of like, you know, my son was born that year, my daughter's now two, he's going, he's just gone to primary school and you just get to the point where you don't remember that stuff. So there are times where it's gone minus three, four, five outside and I've completely forgotten to heat it. Um, and yes, there's some casualties, but most of the stuff has lived. Yeah. Um, and so what you see here now is a absolute pr total proof of trial and error gone right. Yeah. So you've basically, you've, you've, you wanted this tropical look, but you've kept the ones that are on the hardier side of tropical if, in terms of obviously you, it'll drop down to what sort it's of been an five degrees, it, it, 10 degrees. And, for, I, I would yeah. say it goes to single figures in the coldest part yeah. and I don't want to go below five. Right, okay. Uh, as a very good rule of thumb, the stuff that's in here would live in Florida. Yeah. Florida can go quite cool um, and anything in here would tend to do okay in the Southern American states where it can get cooler but not sub-zero temperatures. Um, and again, I do try and keep it reasonable but I think I, I think I worked out that if I was going to try and heat this, for, for, if I, I mean, it, it's two kilowatt hours. What's a kilowatt hour nowadays? 40p, something like that. Yeah. So 80p an hour to heat this. Yeah. Yeah. If you have it on 24 hours a day for a full week, it adds up. It really does. So it really does. I would only do it in the absolute extreme necessity. And over the years, I've become more relaxed about what I deem to be the extreme necessity. Yeah. I think that's the way to go because I mean I was the same I was keeping my greenhouse like 10 12 degrees yeah and, it's and not necessary it's, you don't need to do it I mean there's some plants look sickly and unhappy at the end of winter but sure most do come back and look good yeah um, well this, this greenhouse to be fair every winter come March April I look at it thinking oh my god this looks awful and then after a few months of the heat that it requires it looks lush yeah. And this and this, and like I say, I it thrives through neglect. Some of these monstera leaves back here are ginormous, huge fenestrations, and that started off as a five quid B and Q plant. I think it was on sale. Fantastic. Um, and it's grown up and it's winding up and round that fake tree and this this um asparagus fern here started down here. Yep. And it's actually self-seeded up into the canopy. So it's now up here. Oh, wow, yeah. It's it's self-seeded into an old Hoyer pot. The Hoyer's died, but it's found its way up yeah. there. And I've just left it because it looks cool. No, it looks really, really good. You know? Um, so what's, what are these fake trunks, as you call them? Uh, the fake trunks are PVC toilet pipe, which I have wrapped in coir to try and emulate branches. Um, you can see I have bromeliads hanging off them. I have ur plants hanging off them. I've got monsteras growing up them. So I ran out, totally ran out of space in the beds and I had to go aerial. 
Um, I My main thing, other than Banda Orchids, is probably things that climb or hang. And so the plan is to get more bromeliads and mount them. But the problem with that is that they require more care than what I have to give. Yeah. So this whole bed down on your left is all bromeliads. Yeah, these are stunning. Stunning plants. They're just like so out of this world, aren't they? So unusual looking. I think that's what I like about them. They just look so mental. Yeah. Like they just don't even look like plants. Um, I think the first one I ever got was some form of an ananas. It's called like a variegated white and yellow um, pineapple plant yeah. and I bought it and it just didn't do anything it had these serrated edges on it it was angry it did nothing I was like what the hell is this and then it just started sending up flower shoots I was like this is mad so the Alcantar Alcantara Imperialis I mean these are absolutely ginormous yeah, you won't huge. see them any bigger no, um, and I think I mentioned last time I bought a couple of extras so there are two outside in the garden, which are smaller, which I got from Desert to Jungle. Um, and they look how they would do. So this ideally would much, much prefer full sunshine. Right, now, okay. it's actually gone green in the greenhouse. But outside, it's a really dark crimson purple. And it's really interesting to see how it's responded to different light conditions, even yeah. in the same garden. Yeah. But those plants will come in and I... I can't tell you how much I have cut down on the tender stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a learning curve. It's also a bit of a, uh, bit of a, a cycle that goes through, isn't it? So when people 100%. get interested in exotic plants... Everyone has to have the end set. Yeah. And then you try and overwinter it for the first year and it rots off and you think, oh, for God's sake, what did I do wrong? And the reality is you did nothing wrong because they rot for everyone. Yeah. I mean, I consider myself a pretty experienced tropical gardener now. And I had 27 Enset Morellii at one point. Yeah. And I lost 20 of them in one winter. Wow. And was that just to... They just rotted at the base. Right. Yeah. They and either... Is, it's an issue. I always say to people, it's like storing apples. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're in an orchard, you store apples. You've got to make sure you don't have any that have got bumps on because rot gets in. Yeah. If you've not handled them carefully, then they can very easily over winter just... To come to to rot and everything, even if you've got the right temperature in the right location. Yeah. Um, so they are they are a bit temperamental. They're worth, I think, you know. If you can. Depending the uh, onsets, I think they're a, a fantastic plant because they do grow well. In our, yes. Uh, well, I I kind of I kind of need someone like you to come and look after them so that yeah. you can I can guarantee that they'll be okay rather than me fudging it and thinking oh crap I've not brought them in early enough because yeah. we're getting about the time now where my, my favorite time of the year where yeah. everyone on the group says oh my god how are we going to overwinter stuff and you're like oh for god's sake okay then I was like just watch what all the experienced guys do when they bring them in you bring yeah. them in well there is that I think you know we're talking about the sort of the, the life cycle of uh, exotic gardeners in terms of what plants are by at the beginning they cherry pick all the best things to see on on groups and oh 100 percent and things and then they get to this time of year, so September, and then it's only September, but people are starting to think about winter already, believe yeah. it or not. Um, and they think, oh, how are we going to overwinter this? Or they're completely blasé and think everything's hard and, yeah. and we'll survive. But yeah. um, you will go through, you'll lose plants, you'll try plants again, and then you'll get to a balance, a bit of an equilibrium where you've got the exotic look without too many hard to look after plants. Yeah, plants. Th this, this, is, this is not normal. I mean, this is an obsession Beyond, beyond obsession but in the actual garden if we go outside and have a little look yeah. um i have got um a couple of onset morelli eyes which i've actually just got in pots this year they give the effect yeah. they look good probably should have been tidied up a little bit so are these if i can overwinter them winter? probably not I'd like them to, and if they do, it's a Brucey bonus. Yeah, so where are but they going to be over winter? They're going to be in the greenhouse. Right, yeah, they should. I mean, they should get through. I'd like to think so, but I think I think they cost six quid each. Yeah. And if they just happen to be summer bedding, yeah. and I could have new ones next year that look like this come this time of year, I wouldn't be too upset. Yeah. Of course, I'd love them to be absolute gargantuans. Yeah. And in an absolutely ideal world it would have gone into the ground. Yeah. No two ways about it. But for what it is and where it's situated, softens edges, looks quite good in a funky pot, 
I'm not unhappy with it. If it lives next year, it will definitely go in the ground. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they do get a lot bigger if you plant them out, but obviously... Well, I said I'd never buy another one. Yeah, so... But I couldn't help myself. You've lost 20 odds, but you still bought some. Ex why not? Yeah, yeah, why not? I think the sun's going to come out. I think it's trying to burn through, isn't it? So, guys that have seen previous videos will know that my intention over here next to the jungle hut was to try and cover up next door's house. And you can see that the um, um, Luteopara and the um, Eucalyptus are having a pretty good go. They've done a good job there. Yeah. That. Especially the, you know, the, the large grass, the Luteopara, that's absolutely huge. It's got to be eight metres tall. Yeah, so that's, that's a grass I've not tried uh, simply because I know it can run. But it's oh, yeah. Thing, uh, We'll have a close look at it in it. Well, it definitely runs. It's an absolute thug. It needs space. Behind there is, I mean, intertwined in that whole area is various bamboos. And yet that is the absolute dominating factor. Um, and yes, it is a complete thug. Which way do you want to go? Should we go this way? Yep. So, coleus. I have bought coleus and softer edge plants like osteosperms in the past from online retailers. They are small, they're too early. I got these from Garden Center and they look great. They just, they, they, it's like they come on steroids, they're brilliant. So these online retailers, you kind of get it, trigger, trigger fingers around Christmas, New Year, you kind of think, oh, I need to start off. Just wait. Yeah, these are light levels we don't have in the early. Yeah, they just the don't year. like it. And if, you, if you're more green fingered than I am and you can get them to root in water and you can overwinter them, great but I've never succeeded. Yeah. So it's if also you... the balance between, you know, they really want lots of heat and light in the winter months to grow plants, to get big enough to be out. The amount of so... money and effort you'd spend on doing it, you might as well just buy some new and ones. that's it, yeah. So Realistically. I, I do a mixture, I, do, I grow some from seed, but then I do buy it, you know, get plants from garden centers as well, just to get that mix and cuttings as well. Yeah, 100%. But, um, yeah. So here's a phoenix that is coming back but has been severely stunted by winter. You can see it's not very happy, but it seems to be coming back. Glad, yeah, glad I didn't take it out, but yeah, jury's... Jury... I would hope so. Yeah, yeah I, I, I wish I was as optimistic as you, Chris. No, it, I'm sure it will. It's, it looks like it's got the there. You've got you know, four or five leaves in the centre ready to come out. As long as we don't have a really cold winter again. You said it. Fine. You said it. Um, so, um, Euphorbia Pasteurai John Phillips is still looking fantastic, absolutely ginormous. And then you've got things like the Solanums around the outside, Choisia. And so, it, that, this is really encroached on the pathway. But I've just let it do its own thing because it just looks spectacular. Um, Sterilitia Nicolai, that's thrown out new leaves this year. Yes, there is some damage to the leaves, but this is my thing about bananas. This is what they look like. Okay, so don't worry about them having stripped leaves and leaves getting damaged in the wind. It's what they look like. Yep. Um, Eucomis uh, sparkling burgundy hasn't flowered, but the foliage just looks awesome. It does. Um, and these are the Alcantaria imperialis. Ah. So you can see the difference in the coloration. Yeah, totally. That really deep burgundy on the outside yeah. versus inside without the light levels. They just have that real green appearance, which... I don't dislike because they grow so well in there. And these are another plant. All of these will have to come in over winter, but there's the space for it, Yeah. you know? So um, the beds around here are just a mixture of different things. So hookeras, eucomis, uh, fuchsias, coleus, ferns, um, rudbeckia. And I'm very sad to yeah. say, so, I mean, beautiful colour down here then, we'll just pan upwards and we can see a palm that's looking less than, less oh, than happy. Chris, you're showing off my failures. Well, you know... I think Tropical gardens aren't supposed to have failures on YouTube, Chris. Well, the, well, Come on, man. This is what's and all, this is real gardening. Real gardening, real gardening with Mark. So, yeah, unfortunately, <clears throat> I've given it the whole summer um, and I went for it, pulled the leaves out in the middle and it has completely rotted off. So I now find myself in the incom incomprehensible dilemma of, do I replace it with another bra here? The other two, this one in this raised bed, this one in this raised bed, no more than 10 meters between them all. Two guys, these two are looking fantastic. And this one, 
has died a death. I mean, they're totally untouched over there. Absolutely they're untouched, too. yeah. And, and, you know, there's hardly any difference, like I said, in, in distance, you can say, just a few metres. They've had exactly the same treatment, which is the real frustration and another very good lesson for anyone who wants to start on a tropical garden journey is that you can give something the best of care and equal treatment and for whatever reason it just dies so i'm now in the dilemma of do i replace it with the same thing or do i replace it with something different and hardier my immediate thought was a yucca rostrata would look great in that position and it would still give off that blue vibe that i was going for but it would be different and it would be a, a different palm it wouldn't have the same symmetry and if anyone is into the whole design idea and the symmetry and the repetition you know you want things in threes there's three brahias if i don't have it it'll play havoc with me yeah but i mean you've had was it minus six minus seven -ish? minus seven i think minus yeah seven. yeah i mean if you just grown one briar mater say this one here that's looking great yeah you would probably say to me now oh, it's untouched by cold weather it's totally hard it's totally buy one fine. yeah um whereas if you just grow on this one you'd say don't grow this again 100 percent. it's not hardy at all but as we've just shown we've got the same plant the same size same garden same conditions two look great and one unfortunately is probably well it is it's, it's dead isn't it it's as dead as dodo and i i am i am considering as a last resort taking a chainsaw to it and seeing if it comes back but i also i also want to have something that looks good and not have to maybe leave it three or four years to recover yeah so i'm i think unfortunately that's going to be one for the skip um but again we are in september and i know that we are all thinking about winter i'm not going to buy one now because i'm gonna have to flip and keep it over winter exactly let the nurseries look after 100 percent. yeah then, uh... this is not the time of year to be buying specimen palms uh, specimen palms it is the time of year to let them worry about it yeah. and if it lives over winter buy it in spring because yeah. the chances unless you get an absolute bargain yes well bargains are fewer and further between nowadays but i have messaged a few places and there are some for sale online and you know i i am i am thinking about it but at the moment i haven't pulled the trigger no. um I, I was absolutely fine with it until I had royalty come round to video record it, and <laughs> now I'm feeling very sheepish about it. But I think, I mean, personally, I would replace it with the same with the same palm because it, you've got that, you know, you've got the matching two there. Having that third one just sort of finishes off this area, doesn't it? I think you're right. It's just you're gonna have to, you know, unfortunately, you know, dig it down into your pockets and. Uh, pay for another large brayer yeah well I've deep pack, deep pockets and short arms yeah. but anyway so yeah we've um i've also added this year so obviously we've got the coleus here but i've got some crinum lilies i've got some dahlias i've got some um trades county and maidens blush and i just think the the mixture looks really well um yeah, lots of color. and lots if you if you ignore the dead palm we kind of Co so, yeah, co cover up the dead palm I'm not, I'm not showing that, but we've got some very happy echeveras at the base here we've got some agave um bractifolia the squid agave nice and hardy one. yeah and, and and these these i'll take cuttings from or i'll remove them entirely and the aeoniums will quite happily be completely cut off stuck in some soil and they'll reroute exactly. more than happily yeah so no worries about those guys um and they were they were bought this year um from a nursery just stuck in there and if you chose to you could take probably 40 plants from this lot here yeah i mean it's, it's so easy to propagate um yeah you end up with more plants you know what to do with they're, yeah yeah they're, they're they're a great plant to play with and you know as i've said before buy it propagate it sell it you know fund someone else's fund addiction and yeah, oh absolutely 100 yeah, yeah. perhaps not to a brahi armata standard well, you but you know you have to yeah you'd have to do a few for that um so i guess we can go and have a look at the bananas then That's so perfect. you probably have seen or an awful lot of your viewers will have seen the destruction of the banana beds what i described as the som previously well this is where we are They've really, really come back well because they were pretty much destroyed down to ground level. They were at ground level, actually. And I'd say that the tallest point of the highest roller there has got to be 10, 12 feet. 
possibly. The um, my my main specimen um, Montbelliardi, um, which does get overwintered, and I have to say, is so much easier to overwinter the Morelli eye. Totally, yeah. It's Absolutely. so much easier. So much easier. Um, and so this is the one I really focus on. I absolutely love this plant. This is its fourth year. It looks fantastic. It started off as an absolute tiddler um, from jungle seeds. Unfortunately, not doing any plants at the moment, but I know they've changed hands. Hopefully, when they do start doing plants again, they might have some. Um, but so much easier than Morelli eye. If you can get your hands on one, they are hard to get hold of, but they're so much easier yeah. to deal with. So we're looking at the bananas here now, and if I, we've got some Canna um, Russian Red Musifolia, um, which was so popular after Monty did a thing a few years ago. But if I kind of just stand in here, which again, people who look at a lot of these videos online will remember, these are now, I'm six foot three, and they're well above me, and they were cut back to ground level. So. If you needed proof that you can leave Musa Baju and Canners unprotected over winter, this is it. Yeah, I mean, they have done incredibly well. Yeah. Just to compare and contrast with the fortunes of Musa Baju in my garden, mine look like terrible after winter and they did not come back properly. Is that right? They've just, you know, they're, they're down here, basically. You, you had it... Um, Sikimensis, on the other hand, looks fantastic. I've got a sicky around the corner that, again, has done really well and that was left out and... Yeah, like I say, you, you had it colder and you're a far more exposed site. I mean, this is an old quarry, but I've put fences up and I've got stuff in here which really does massively protect. Um, you can get a view here of the Luteopara. If you come and stand in here and look upwards, it, it started off as a small clump and it really goes for it. Um, I unfortunately brought some bind, I, yeah, I brought some bindweed back with me from a nursery a few years ago and it is ravage this bed um but Can't see any. Uh, a bit, oh, yeah, yeah. A anyone anyone who knows anything about bindweed will know that once it's there it's very hard it to hard eradicate to but i mean just looking through here the shot i've got in focus now it looks like it looks like bamboo this it does it looks just like an, an almost and it's, it's glaucus it looks like berinda it looks fantastic it, it does. does spread but you can rip up parts of it sell it to other people i think i got it from pan global in fact, I'm 90% sure I got it from Pan, Pan Global, um, and it looks great. And it, uh, and it's an if you've got the space for it, you've got room for it. It's an absolute go-to. It's fantastic. Um, you can also see after you've got a tetrapanax in the ground for a few years, this is how far it spreads. It's gone absolutely cuckoo. Um, yeah, and this is from one. This is from two separate plants. One in here, which seen which died at the top but has re-sprouted from the sides and another one on this side which is a more clear and obvious one which again died at the top but has actually re-sprouted from the sides um, and it's very much doing its own thing but the stress of the cold winter just sent suckers out everywhere yeah. There. Wow, they're right through there. Let's have a look. No, oh, they go on. Yeah, yeah they really do go on. They, they, and, and this is exactly what I wanted it to be now, which is pure jungle. Yeah. So leaf litter stays where it is. Um, it, yes, there's irrigation and there's water, but these are all now more than established enough that they don't need additional water. And they don't get it because yeah. I don't give it to them because I don't have the time. But again, it, this shows variability because like my Tetrapanax had no dieback whatsoever. Wow. Never shown dieback, even when we had minus 10. Um, and all, yours has, and many other people's have. It just showed the variability in the, in the same plant with the same conditions. I think the thing that I would say about this plant is that I bought it from a garden centre as quite an established plant, and it was quite tall already. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, because because it went in as a relatively established plant, it wasn't a baby. I don't think it established itself quite as well as if you put a younger, smaller plant in, um, whereas the one you put in might have been a younger plant. Yeah, yeah. So I think that also goes to show, and we, we talk about specimen plants all the time, and I know I talk about right plant, right place, it's my kind of thing, but if you're going to put a plant in, like if you're going to get a cord line, don't spend 300 quid on a cord line that's massive. No, no. Get a small one, let it grow. Yeah. The root system will be much happier for it, and it'll be far more established and it'll be more able to 
throw off these winters and you have it you're far more exposed and you have far colder than we do yeah and it just goes to show it's, it's a it's a funny one isn't it now my camera's trying to highlight a plant behind you it's sort of, sort of what this 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 one this here. one yeah don't look at that it? one um so this is another phoenix palm um which it's yeah it is alive burly um that one was purchased as a big specimen plant thankfully when they weren't terribly expensive it was a giant plant i think it cost me 150 quid um it's been in place it wasn't touched by two previous winters but last winter just it was just too much it was too much yeah. so i had some smaller phoenixes four of which have died and um these are the ones that i've left in place they're really not happy yeah. but i mean the dilemma we all have when we get this situation is do you keep it or do you dig it up because it will take you know it will start looking good again next year if you have a mild winter yeah but obviously you've got to live with the dead foliage for you know a season or two uh, the the god's honest truth is i would probably bin that off mm. I, I i would probably get rid and if i could find something else that i wanted to replace it with i would probably do that because it looks awful um and i said i've said in video, videos before um I know I've recanted on the Morellii, but I will never buy another Phoenix. I just won't. It's just, they're a waste. In this country, they're just not hardy enough. And so the one that's by the path that's starting to regenerate, okay, maybe, but this one, I think, possibly too far gone. So I think it's this winter will decide its fate, probably, in yeah. terms of will it survive or not, because, you know, if we have a mild winter, it will get through and it should grow happily away. But if we have another winter the same, it will probably, you know. I think it'll be curtains, and I think, yeah. I think, I think naturally it will have made its decision for me. So, um, yeah, but the. Let's have a look. This is the main lawn area with the globe. Yeah, so the globe uh, again, kind of gone a bit green. Not quite as green as previously, but it's a bit green. Needed to have been. You need to top it up with the anti-algae stuff, and I've forgotten to do it, and it needs a good clean, and I just haven't got round to it. But it, it, it is 100%, and but it looks great. It, I mean, I it looks fantastic. The symmetry of the different globes, I think it looks really cool. And then this bed over here, which is kind of the main palm bed. So you've got the feather palms here. You've got the uh, Brahia Marta. You've got cannas that are growing up, Canna Pretoria, uh, and some Tradescantia Maiden Blush. You've got bamboos that are all doing their thing and mixing around. Nasturtiums that have self-seeded. Osteospermums I've put in. They look great. Coleus Campfire. Needed more water. Hasn't had it. Um, the Persicaria um, grew. I cut it back. I've had loads of fresh growth, and it seems to have suffered a bit. But again, we're not too worried about that. Um, Sontrus tree dandelion never brought in during winter that regrows every single year and the foliage looks awesome that's fantastic that is not a plant that I've grown too much of or you know I've had it from seed uh, and sold it to be honest with you open days yes left. so you say that's a hardy plant a plant that keeps returning it's or? been fully hardy for me I've never brought it in um, and I think it looks great the people are always amazed that it's a dandelion yeah. um, it probably could look better if I did protect it, but I've just found that there's no need to, and I'm too lazy to bother. That's great to know. Yeah. So I grew ricinus from seed this year, and they've kind of gone in. They're properly stunted. Last year, I had some ones that went in. I grew them in the greenhouse. They went really leggy. I stuck them in there anyway as a proper filler plant, and they've done okay. But, you know, um, the whole idea of this bed was to have the jabea and everything grow up well there was a phoenix palm in here on the right hand side that's been replaced by the parajub which is doing exactly what you'd expect it to in its first year in the ground having been moved hopefully in the next two or three years it should recover yeah so they'll you know they'll sulk a little it's bit, gonna sulk yeah in, and then hopefully grow but the really idea well. the idea is in 15 years time they'll all be absolutely ginormous and i'll be able to underplant whether it'll quite happen that way we don't know but um, everything's kind of doing its thing. Now, this can of Stuttgart is absolutely in the right place. These leaves are beautifully variegated. Yes, there's some sunburn on them, but they're flowered. The flowers look incredible. They're taller than six feet. They're protected by the overhanging canopy, and they're also protected by these ginormous Paulonia leaves. Paulonia leaves. 
Um, this is its second year in the ground. Wow, so that's... Um, that's haven't, co haven't coppiced it, haven't touched it, but they are absolutely ginormous. Um, I can't remember whether this is the standard one or another one that starts with a K. Right. Can you remember it? Uh, can, can our... Uh, 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 that one, yeah. I'll, some, put, I'll put the name on the screen. Yeah, I can't it. remember what it's... Yeah. But it's a, there's a fancy, ver can, fancy one, but it's ginormous it and it's had no special treatment whatsoever. So that looks really good with the kind of offset of the, um, of the different, you know, and these are kind of cottage garden plants, you know, but just the, 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 the yeah, the Balanops, they just kind of add different bits in. Um, you've got the different grasses, softening edges. Um, this, as always, this euphorbia, it always grows really leggy. I'm going to, I'm going to dig this out this year and I'm going to replace it with something different because it always goes really leggy. Have to cut it back because it sprawls everywhere. Yeah. Um, in here, I've got a euphorbia again, which I've had to cut back because it was gotten too big. You couldn't see the moon gate. You couldn't get through here, but that's now starting to recover. If you ever have to cut a euphorbia back, the sap is really caustic. So just be careful, yeah, it's a, especially, it's a job, isn't it, really? yeah, if you've got sensitive skin, it's really, but you can see even where it's been cut back, you've got loads of side shoots now. So they do respond really well to being hacked into, um, and it'll probably come back bushier and healthier, less leggy, you know. In this section here, which this little offshoot of the garden, this is kind of where, I've said this is Paul in the past, so Paul separates Paul? the east from the west. So over here is the tree ferns, and over this side is the palms. Brassiopsis, um, probably not as happy as I'd like it to be, but the walking stick lives, and for anyone who's seen George's previous videos, it has grown a good foot this year. It really has. It's definitely grown this year. Yeah, it's not a plant you see in every garden. It's not, not, yeah. not at all. No, and it's got through the winter, so that's fantastic. It's got through the winter um, and it's doing its thing. Yeah. Um, last time there was lots and lots of petasites japonicus. They've now subsequently died back. And then the ferns underneath, which have been massively stunted because they've not had the light levels in early summer, um, they're suffering for it. Um, and I know that we spoke before we started to film saying that you tried to get rid of yours as best you can. Yeah, I mean, it is a bit of a thug. It does want to spread everywhere and it'll just keep sending up shoots from all the uh, the roots and the runners. But you can get on top of it and sort of tame it somewhat. I think I will probably replace what I tried to achieve, which is the Asplenium heart's tone, tongue fern in here on mass with things like this, these hardy ferns that just really go for it because yeah. that's what this area really wants. It really wants really lush fern foliage that copes with the overhanging trees, copes with the shade, you know, that they, they, they will be re, re, really happy for it. Um, the tree ferns yeah, have gone absolutely. talk about these. No. Yeah, I mean, I'm pleased to say that when Chris arrived, he said that they were bigger than he thought, which was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what can I say? But again, perfect example these are absolutely filled with this year's leaf litter and i will not remove that that is this year's winter protection yeah i mean i think we should you know point out a, a key plant to help in these tree ferns is the sycamore tree above and the other trees above isn't it yeah and the sycamores as everyone knows are just about to start throwing all those little helicopter things down and if you look at this tree fern here, you can see all of the seedlings that have tried to make it that haven't. And I have done nothing. There's cobwebs, there's old branches, there's wasps stood in, stuck in spiders' webs. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. You know, the, this whole thing has just been absolutely left. Round the side, there are tree ferns with uh, epiphytic plants that have come along for the journey. Um, there's there's um, birds nests there's there's ivy growing up them um there's you know two years ferns two years fronds last year's fronds this year's fronds yes you're, keep, you're keeping it natural and sort of replicating its uh native habitat basically no bushes have been trimmed in the making of this video no. um it, I, I like to let them just do their thing i'm not someone who mollycoddles them to the point of you know 
I don't want to restrict the crowns. I want them to do what they would have done naturally. And this kind of thing, you know, this is probably not an unrealistic spacing for how they would be naturally. And this is a frond that's come down, it's sat here, but you know, in its own way, this is, this is providing its own little protection. It's its own little microclimate. Come yeah. winter, these things all intertwining and intermingling, intermingling it's not going to do any harm whatsoever for, for the, into, uh, the overwintering process. And I've said it before, I will do nothing with these overwinter. They'll have no fleece, no protection, no hessian sacks, nothing. I mean, it really helps you've got them growing in the right location in your garden. I've said it before, I'll say it again, right plant, right place. Right plant, right place. And having plants fully exposed, as you can see in, in, the, in the beds over here, there is examples of plants that are more exposed to sun. And you just look and try and compare these ferns to those ferns. Yeah, there's a, a huge difference. I mean, that one up here is huge, but it's got a full you know, crown of leaves, absolutely long, lush leaves on that one. They, I mean, those, those fronds would be four, maybe five foot long. Yeah, stunning. And then you compare to these two in more of an exposed location. We're not far away, but still a bit more prominent in the garden. Well, anyone who's seen previous videos will know that this is my first tree fern. And this tree fern had been hacked back and done what everyone told me I should do, which is cut off the old fern, cut off the old fronds. Um, and these would be the original fronds right here. They were cut back. And they had everything done to them that I was told to do. And I believe that this stunting and narrowing is a direct result to not leaving them to do what they should do and yeah. not leaving them as they ought to be. So this was my learn, this was my lesson, this is what I've learned from, and everything from there is a direct result of just letting them be. And I think they've done okay for it. Um, so it really does start to get very overgrown in here now. It, it really does start to get very overgrown. So you've got Brunnera on the floor. You've got um, the Pseudopanax. You've got smaller tree ferns. I mean, that is a half foot tree fern that's thrown out six foot yeah. fronds. Yeah, and then- You need a huge tree fern to make a, a big impact. Yeah, I mean, it, size doesn't matter in some cases, Chris. Not always. Um, You've got the epiphytic parts of this. You've got these things that are all growing that I'll Albizia maybe, I can't remember no, the name I mean, of it, yeah, but these stuff. are all growing, I'll do nothing to them, I'm not taking them off, they just, they can do their own thing. Um, and then in here, you've really got to go ferreting through now, you're quite tall so I'll uh, I'll move my vegetation out of the way for you, you. there you go. Not an offer you'll get many, but <laughs> again, so this is, this is, a, a, again, as good a proof of everything gets left to its own devices. You've got some ginormous gunner leaves in here, perhaps not as big as some other people's who have, you know, I, it is in the wrong place. I, I'll completely openly accept it's in the wrong place. I made mistakes on the gunnera. I've put ponds in with no drainage. They are sat directly in pond water with no drainage. <laughs> and um, they don't have as much sunlight as what they would like, but the leaves are still easily a meter across. Yeah, yeah it's, it's doing well. I mean, it could do better, but it's a, it's a great sort of jungle leaf plant to have in this area. Yeah, it's it's it fills the space. It looks great. Um, and then you've got things here like the Scheffler macrophylla, which is throwing out new leaves, getting to a decent size now. Um, Scheffler alpina, which is probably grown a good meter this year actually yeah, it's really gone for it hasn't it, it really has and then you've got the metapanics off the side there as well and these are things once you've once you're doing your tropical garden and you've started to do it and you've really started to tick off your list the basics that you want to get in you can start to add these really cool different plants in um that are just a bit different and you know if you go on places the specialist growers like pan global krug um see you know if you go down to cornwall and see these gardens where they sell these unusual things you know have a look at the label speak to the guys there and buy them and grow them and see how they do because i cannot grow scheffler taiwaniana or rhododendrifolia for the life of me
Which you should be able to because they're hard enough. Hundred percent. But Alpina, Digitalia, Macrophylla, they just seem to like it. And so you know, sometimes if you don't have success with the more standard ones, try something different. Do some research. Do some reading around it. See whether something else has worked for you. Yeah, I mean, look at this macrophylla. This is one where, you know, I grow this one as well, and it's got through every winter. It did defoliate somewhat last yeah, winter. Yeah. But there's other people that will say, no, this will not survive outside at all, never mind in Yorkshire or north of England. Even yeah. the South Coast people won't try it outside, but it's definitely worth trying. George is, as the crow flies, eight miles away from here. And his died last year, and he's not replaced it. Yeah. And yet this one didn't even defoliate, which I'm very pleased to say, <laughs> have to say. Um, but yeah, we're in a bit of competition. But yeah, this one didn't even defoliate, you know. So again, and I don't think, uh, it goes back to the bra here. Perfect example. You treat things well, doesn't even necessarily mean that it's going to live. No. And it's not a reflection of the individual grower. No. It's just a reflection of how's your look, how are the conditions, and how has the individual plant been affected. Yeah. Some things are just dying. Some things are just out of your control. Yeah. And that's so difficult to get your head around, especially when you know you do everything you can. And it's it's more obvious when you have the guys that have one Moussa Baju, one tree fern. One of everything. Which is absolutely understandable because these things are expensive and the hobby takes a while to get into. But when you, you know, I, I, I love it when it's kind of, I shouldn't say I love it, it sounds a bit sadistic, but when it's midsummer and your, your moose is sending out new rollers and then the wind comes and people try, people try and protect the leaves. Just like, it's what they do. Yeah, they're meant to shred. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah, it's what they look like, yeah. you know. So trying to protect that perfect roller from being shredded, for me, isn't what it's about because that's what they are supposed to look like. They're supposed to be shredded. So if you come and take a shot over the garden here um, and you see that Musa over there with the giant perfect roller, yeah, that's going to get shredded soon. I'm not going to try and protect it because they look shredded. I mean, I've been on holiday before where in Thailand where they put new rollers out almost every day you have a tropical storm it gets shredded and they're all the more beautiful for it yeah. so now we're on the pathway next to the greenhouse with my hanging baskets um hanging baskets nice. yeah thank you so you've got some lismachia here which trails then you've got some calabrachoa um strawberry bells with impatience and then you've got Ipomia, the sweet potato. Now that was supposed to have grown, but it hasn't. So I won't be doing that next year. I'll be using what I usually use, which is Thumbergia, Black Eyed Susan, because yeah. that goes mad. Um, but again, it's all trial and error, complete trial and error. You just, you know, do try things one year. If it doesn't work for you, that's okay. It didn't work, try something different. And that's the thing with especially things like, you know, bedding plants and hanging baskets is you get to try things every year. Hundred percent. Annual, annual plant. And, the, and these are a perfect example of something that I tried this year, didn't quite work. I'll go back to the old way next year, but there are things that I would keep. So the Lismachia is something new this year. I will definitely keep that. The Impatience I think look great. And I think the contrast between everything's good, but the Epomia hasn't kind of grown. Now, no. could I have trained it? Maybe, but- it's just... They do better with really hot summers. Yeah, they do. And we've not had it. So no. maybe they'll start doing what I wanted them to do in the next two weeks. There you go. Um, Wollamy Pine, um, this has grown probably a foot this year. It's really started to go for it. And we've started to get the cones on it as well. So that's looking really nice. Um, and then salvia, this is just a bog standard salvia from the garden center. It's not Armistad. Um, and I think that the offset, the combination of colors, the blue with the Euphorbia um, Glacier Blue, I think looks really cool. Um, and it's trial and error. I haven't used this one before but I would definitely use it again. Yeah, um, is this the sort of plant you will try to buy again next year, take cuttings off to go over winter, or leave this and hope it comes back? I would love to tell you that I'll take cuttings from it. Yeah. Um, and if I have the time and I remember to, I would absolutely take cuttings. But if the cuttings survive to a point that I could use them, I'd be over the moon. But I don't have a huge success rate with taking cuttings off anything. 
Okay. Um, it's just something I don't seem to be very good in that respect. Um, I mean, Salvi is a good one because they do take so easily, so he should be able to get some roots on cuttings pretty quickly. Yeah, it, well, it, maybe, it, maybe I'll give it a go. Maybe I'll take your word for it that it's going to go well. Um, you've also got begonia here. This is a hardy begonia, so this has stayed in. I got this from, oh, what's the place in Rotherham called? Well, yes yeah yeah so i got that from there and that's been fabulous um and that again stays in which you wouldn't think of a begonia but it's really happy and then you've got the offset of the irises and the nandina yucca gloriosa and then you've got the uh, tabulari can't remember that was looking really well but started to die off this year and um, this time of year it's getting a bit dry yeah um and then that's kind of full circle oh apart from this little bit here um, so this is the bit of the garden that I started with uh, originally, really. So this is the house, we had the bifold doors put in and when we came here seven or eight years ago, this was the old vegetable plot. So I put the raised beds in um, and this is a good example of a tetrapanax which has not defoliated all year because it's so close to the house and it just looks absolutely yeah, awesome. Um, oh, it's great. it's got the protection of the house. Um, it's and it's got the you know it's got things going. It's got the Japanese and enemies. It's got the Daphne next to it. Um, it's got the hanging basket with the sempervivums in. That yeah. it's looking really cool. Um, and this is a perfect example of the protection of the house and the heat that the house gives off. Just allows this to live in its own little microclimate. I mean this this had leaves on it in April. Um, and it's grown there's two different growth points on it now if you get in there you can see there's two different growth points on it and it's looking really cool and i i would expect this to flower this year um again yeah we get into that time of year where if, if you've not grown tetrapanics before when we get into sort of autumn the leaves do get smaller and smaller and people yes. sometimes think oh why are they getting smaller leaves why they're not getting bigger and it's because it's getting ready to getting ready for winter yeah and flower yeah absolutely um, but yeah, so it's all kind of, I'm really pleased with it. It's going into, like I say, into its fourth or fifth year where it's kind of doing its thing. Um, it's becoming the proper jungle that I wanted it to. And it's nice to be able to share it with people and people see it. And, and like I say, I have, I have dealt with it in a very low maintenance way, probably too low maintenance, but I do just let it do its thing. It just goes to show if you want to have an exotic garden, you don't have to spend, you know, every single daylight hour. It's not a five day a week job at all. Um, I would say in earnest, I've probably spent three full days in the garden this year, clearing away winter damage, feeding, watering and adding plants in that I would consider to be annuals. That's the coleus, the osteospermums, um, and really giving everything a proper tidy up. Now, if you consider that's three full days, I'd say what, maybe 24 hours in total across what has been effectively five months. Yeah, and we've created this, you know, quite stunning garden. Yeah, and the, the, the beauty of a garden like this, and the beauty of the tropical style is you can have some failures and you can have some things that, you know, you can have weeds growing in amongst it because the foliage is so lush, you might not perhaps see it as quite as clear as you would on other gardens. So it is, it is a very forgiving style of gardening as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, I just love it. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Mark, for showing us around the garden. It's been a, it's been a pleasure to see it in the flesh. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. And. Uh, You'll see an update, I'm sure, in one of my videos or George's videos in the future, and we'll uh, long make continue. Well, I'm not sure whether George will be welcome again, actually, now that we've had gardening royalty over. I'm not, I don't want to lower my standards. <laughs> you can only go up from here. This is it. <laughs>